Hello, hello, hello. This is Lee Fuller, and you're listening to the Bible in Real Life podcast. And I'm so excited that you're here. We're continuing in our part, our study of um, African descent um, or blacks in the Bible, right? So if you have not gone back and listened to uh, episode one and episode two, or part one and part two, go back and listen to it. We started in Genesis in part one, then we covered and uncovered some uh, characters, uh, some of our heroes in the Old Testament that were um, his- historically and and um, via lineage and history <laughs> were, were Black people, right? Uh, those of African descent from the line of Cush and from the line of Ham is how we're defining uh, the Black people we see in the Bible. So I'm super excited. And let me tell you something. This has been quite an eye-opening, quite an encouraging journey for me through this study. Um, And I'll, I'll tell you why I started this study. I actually began looking into this last year. Um, it was during a time when I was trying to understand what was going on in the country. Um, I was trying to see if there needed to be some type of reconciliation uh, between the church and 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 black people. I just wanted to understand a bit more of the the extent in which um, in which colorism I think is a thing, <laughs> um, and in which discrimination or supremacy or or division in the church had been um had been done so for a long time i heard different things about um the inferiority of man of certain people hey there was this curse in genesis um that that i was like oh wait a minute maybe there is biblical uh evidence or a biblical um standpoint, a uh, viewpoint of some of the treatment of black people throughout history. But I just found it not true. So this study has really helped me do a couple things. One, it has helped me see God in a brand new light, showing that his love for all people, his love for every race, every nationality, um, and how much he has instilled in us, uh, mankind, right? And then to see the depravity of man, to see how mankind would rather have division than unity, right? So we see how there is a difference between God's perfect plan and how God created us and, you know, the depravity and the fall of man, just how it has impacted so many aspects of society. But um, what I want to do is I want to share uh, some more of of characters I found in Scripture in the New Testament that were of African descent. Okay, so let's continue going through this. Um, I, you know, part of me says. I want to continue it and just keep going. So continue listening to the podcast. There may be additional stuff I'll put up on YouTube just to uh, deal with some of the inferiority or the curses that were perceived or, man, when I started digging into this, I saw that, man, your my eyes have been opened, right? And I'm not, uh, I, I blame I blame not a race. I blame the sin nature of people, the sin nature of individuals, right? Um, the Bible says the enemy, Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, right? So if you can steal a person's history, steal some identity, steal valuable references, then you can destroy a a country. You can destroy relationships. You can destroy people um, and destroy the image of Christ, right? But let me let me continue. Um, so that's my introduction. <laughs> Go back and listen to some of the earlier um, episodes. And what I'm going to do now is continue in through into the New Testament to see some biblical characters that were of African descent. Subscribe, 
link to this podcast. Go back and review it a couple times. Uh, look at the references. It it has been a blessing to me to see the contributions of of black people in the Bible and the contributions of people, right? Um, just amazing things, uh, scholars. It's just, okay. I don't want to get emotional, but it's it's really been an amazing journey. And I'm glad you have uh, taken this journey with us. So let's continue and see what we find in scripture. So as we're continuing, um, so we can, we, we touched on it. But in Matthew chapter, um, Matthew chapter one, we can look at the genealogy of Christ, right? So within the genealogy of Christ, I mean, (laughs) we're starting at the very beginning of the New Testament, right? So when we look at, let's go here, um, in the genealogy of Christ, we see uh, Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, um, when we go a little further down, uh, Jacob, the father of Judah, his brothers, and Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez, the father of Hezron, the father of Ram, the father of Aminadab, the father of Nishan, and Nishan, the son of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. Wait a minute. We know the story of Rahab. Rahab was a Canaanite, right? We know from Genesis that many of the tribes in the people groups in Canaan came from Ham. One of Ham's son was Canaan, right? So uh, Rahab was a Canaanite. And then we see Ruth. Ruth is another Canaanite. Remember, she was a Moabite. We learned this from the book of Ruth. So here we see we see intermarrying between the Semites, the, the Jewish people from the line of Shem, and the Canaanites, those from, um, from the line of Ham, right? So in David's own line, we are seeing these people. So who else? Um, and then we look a little further down. Let's go to... Um, let's go to... <clears throat> I may have passed it. Um, oh well, a, a little further up, um, <clears throat> we saw Bathsheba was the um, father or the mother of Solomon, right? So just in Jesus's own own line, we see these these Afro Asiatic <laughs> or Canaanite women included. So um, we're seeing this mixing of cultures. We're seeing this uh, God allowing or engrafting other cultures into the biblical narrative and into the biblical story, right? Another thing that I thought was interesting, and uh, take it for what it's worth, but we know in when Jesus was uh, born and Pharaoh, not Pharaoh, King Herod killed everyone, he was killing the babies to and below, where did Joseph and Mary went? Joseph and Mary went to Egypt, right? We know in Hosea that one of the prophecies of scripture was that, you know, God will call his son out of Egypt. Well, we see that um, Jesus spent time in Egypt, spent time in Africa as a kid, right? So we just see this interplaying of the biblical narrative with the African population and the African nation, right? So um, Matthew chapter 12, let's go to Matthew chapter 12. Um, In Matthew chapter 12, we see a reference to um, Matthew chapter 12, let's go 13. Matthew 12, 13, we see, um, hold on. Matthew, oh, Matthew 12, 42. Okay, I was like, wait a minute. Matthew 12, 42. Okay, so here is a reference. Here is a nod to the Queen of Sheba. So in Matthew 12, 42, it says, the Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. 
For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. So for those of you that may not be as familiar with the context, the queen of the south they're referring to is the queen of Sheba, right? A woman of power, a woman that was um, in charge of Sheba or a, a continent or a country or province, right? So we see black woman in power, so much so she came to see Solomon, right? And the context of the story is, there were people that valued the words of Solomon, i.e. this queen of the South. She valued the words of Solomon and she came to visit. Whereas people now, and in this time that Jesus is mentioning, that someone greater than Solomon is here and people aren't, aren't looking or, or traveling to, uh, the religious leaders weren't traveling to hear the wisdom of someone greater than Solomon, right? So it just shows how this this Nubian princess um, valued wisdom, valued knowledge, and traveled and sought it out. So we see that that this this mentality of lack of intellect or lack of education um, or inferiority uh, propaganda of the the African race was not something demonstrated in in scripture, right? It was something concocted later for control, right? But <laughs> I, I've been reading a little too much, right? I've been reading a little bit too much, but um, it's, just, it's just interesting to see that aspect highlighted of this, this black woman, this queen of Sheba that understood wisdom and sought wisdom from the highest source at the time, which was Solomon, right? So where else do we see? Now, this right here, let's go to Mark. And and we've seen this, this character, right? We've seen this character in Mark, but during this study, I began to, um, I think it's kind of funny. So let's go to Mark 15, Mark 15, 21. We read about... This guy, Simon, right? And this is during the time of the crucifixion. So Jesus is carrying his cross, going to Golgotha to be crucified for the sins of the world, right? And as he's carrying his cross, they see this strong, this strapping man named Simon, right? So let's look and see what's, what happened with Simon. It says, uh, 21, and they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country. Now, if if we didn't know Cyrene was, you know, northern Africa near Libya, right? And if we didn't know where Cyrene was, we can tell by his children that this might have been a black man. He was the father of Alexander and Rufus. <laughs> Listen. If the children's name, here's a little little note, right? If the chill, if one of the, if one of your friends' name, if their son's name is Rufus, if anybody in their family is named Rufus, you talking to a black man? No, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I find humor, um, but. He was the father of Alexander and Rufus. That's how, that's not how we know he's black, right? We know he's black because he was from Cyrene, which is um, a providence in in northern Africa, right? But we see how God is weaving these characters, not only in the story of Jesus' lineage and birth, he's weaving it into the actual moment where Christ is making atonement for the world, right? There is a black man there that also carried Jesus's cross. We see significance in these small little touches where God is, is pulling various nations, various ethnicities into the biblical narrative, right? And Simon of Cyrene was one of those um, people in scripture. We also see in, in Acts. So this is the Gospels, right? Let's go to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we see that, that there are various nationalities. 
Like, so I'm not just saying only black people, right? We see that God has extended his his um his loving arms, his inclusiveness to all his creation. In verse 9, Acts chapter 2, verse 9, it says, The Parthians, the Medes, and Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judah, Cappadocia, Pontius, and Asia, Pergia, Pamphylia, um, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, right? Um, watch this, both Jew and proselytes, Cretans and Cretans, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling their own language and the mighty works of God. So we see that there were Jewish people. There were those, those that, that were drawn to the Jewish faith, faith coming to serve in Passover, right? And then, um, they heard the gospel preached and they went back to their nations. They went back to the areas they're from. And so this is where, now I know we're looking at black people in the Bible, but here we not only see God including uh, those from African descent and those in Egypt and parts of Libya, etc., but we see, we see, um, Asia, we see Arabia, we see other areas in Mesopotamia, um, we see Pontus. So what is God doing? God is showing, you know, uh, for our study, we're looking at uh, black people in the Bible. But if we want to look for um, Asian descent in the Bible, if we want to look for other nationalities, Arabian descent in the Bible, um, you will see it there as well, right? We start to see European <laughs> descent a little later, right? Uh, when Rome and Greece and those, those aspects are a part of it, right? Uh, as the gospel is spread and conquers more and, and infiltrates more of the planet, right? But we do see that the gospel is spreading. The gospel has reached. And let me say something here. The gospel is reaching these continents, reaching these areas prior to British missionaries and Scottish missionaries. Okay. I just want to highlight that because, you know, I'll speak to some people and they'll say, hey, that's the white man's religion. Well, we see that there were those from, from Egypt and Cyrene, parts of Libya and other places that came to uh, Jerusalem and they were preached and heard the gospel from Peter during Pentecost, right? So when they go back to share their experience and what they learned in the gospels, we see that the gospel is reaching these continents years before British and European missionaries. Just want to throw it out there. Take it for what it's worth. All right. So um, I think I, this is amazing as we're looking at how God is prevalent in, in the New Testament. There is another character, and I love this character because it highlights so many amazing things in Scripture. So let's continue in Acts because... Acts is the history book of the New Testament. So we go to Acts chapter 8. We go to Acts chapter 8, and let's go. Um, we'll start at 26. Um, there is a there is a um, huge, um, <clears throat> uh, a lot of implications here. In Acts chapter 26, the angel Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down to down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian. There was an Ethiopian, right? Hey, we don't have to go too deep into the lineage to understand where Ethiopia, right, <laughs> is. Uh, he was a eunuch. And watch this position. A court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians 
who was in charge of all her treasure. So we have a Ethiopian who was the uh, in charge of the treasury of a queen of Ethiopia, right? So if in order to have someone in charge of a treasury, there has to be some, some wealth accumulated. I'm just saying. And this queen um, understood. Uh, so there's this, this queen. Now, I'm not sure if her name was Candace or if Candace was the name of the position, right? Sometimes there's like the pharaoh and sometimes the king or queen may have been called a Candace, right? Okay, so the position may be Candace or the name was Candace. Doesn't matter. She's in Ethiopia. She fits into our category, right? <laughs> but um, when you continue in the story, you see that he's reading Isaiah. Philip goes and um, we see a, a black man desiring to understand the scriptures. He's saying, is he's reading out of Isaiah and he's saying, is this... Uh, is Isaiah speaking of himself or of another, right? He's desiring to understand scripture. He's desiring to see what does God's word say and help me understand this. And Philip breaks it down. He gives him the game. Well, he, he, he shares the scripture. And the Bible says he started from there and showed him Christ. This passage continues that Ethiopian eunuch got baptized. And many believe that this Ethiopian eunuch was instrumental in the growth of the African church, right? A um, growth of the African church. So prior to, prior to the colonization of, of Africa by European nations, we see a Bible mentioned convert, conversion, <laughs> a conversion, right? So I just thought that was amazing and interesting to see these, these proselytes, these um, biblical encounters of black men that were seeking to hear from God and God rewarding their diligence and their salvation and baptism. And then he sends them along his way, right? So, um, outstanding, outstanding. Where else? Let's go to, let's go to Acts chapter 13. Man, as we're going through scripture, and again, Acts is the history book. So when we're reading the history book in the New Testament, we see um, these, um, Acts 13, 1. Now, <clears throat> there are churches through there were Paul was establishing churches and there was just a missionary movement that's going from the apostles, right? We see Philip acting as an evangelist and we see different things. Now look at Acts chapter 13, verse one. Now there was in the church of Antioch, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Milan, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, right? So we see here that there are these, there are these teachers. Um, we see that there are these prophets and teachers, okay? Two of them that we know of, um, what was the name? Simeon, who was called Niger. Listen. I ain't got to be super deep, right? Um, Niger is Latin for black people, right? Um, where we get other terms, right? But Niger and, um, and we have Lucius from Cyrene. So what is this showing us? In the early church, I mean, this is, early, this is in Antioch. This is before Paul and Barnabas get sent off on their missionary journey, right? We see those of African descent as leaders, as prophets and teachers in the first churches. Listen, there is no um, greater evidence of the, the acceptance, the 
um, validation of black people in the establishment of the church than in these instances in Acts, where it's the start of the church. And I hope you are seeing and understanding the relevance of what God is showing that, hey, you do have a part. You have played a major part in the growth of the church, young black person. Um, and also, I want to see even beyond that, that our history didn't start in America, right? So when you look further beyond what you may have been taught or educated on or learned, um, you will see that your history is far richer far more extensive, goes further back than you ever imagined. And in that history, we've been able to outline some in the, in Genesis, throughout the Old Testament, and throughout the New Testament. And we see these, these Black contributions, these Black faces, um, these, these African dissented people, right? So what happens after the Bible? Wait a minute. The, is, there, is there any? Uh, oh, um, so and then 1 Corinthians. Um, I want to keep this one kind of short. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, we read of Apollos. Everybody loves Apollos. He's this eloquent speaker. And I know sometimes um, um, you hear these eloquent uh, orators right? And Apollos was one of those. He was trained in Egypt, in Alexandria of Egypt. Um, so we, we see that, that um, in likelihood, Apollos may have been Black. This is the same Apollos that said, um, Paul planted Apollos water and God gets increase. Yeah, that Apollos, right? Likely of African descent. We know he spent time in, in Alexandria, in the Nile Delta over in Egypt, right? So um, Black contribution to church history, biblical history is profound. I want to do a couple things as we're wrapping up this series. I want to talk a little bit about church history. So after the church, um, I don't want to say church age, after biblical history, there were these church fathers. Now, there are many. There is Polycarp. Uh, there's others, but I want to focus on three. One is Augustine, and Augustine is often called the father of theologians. A lot of what this author wrote became really a grounding, theologically dense, um, sustaining um articulation of the gospel, of what we believe as Christians, even to this day, right? And this uh, individual, Augustine, uh, and I'm reading from uh, Oneness Embraced, uh, a book by Tony Evans, and he says, Augustine, who was by far the most scholarly and influential of all the church fathers, is known as the father of theologians, was not only African, but was most probably also black. We know this because his mother, Monica, was a Berber, and the Berbers were a group of dark-skinned people belonging to the vicinity of Cartilage, right? This black man, all right, and sometimes in Christian, so you hear about St. Augustine, you hear about these people, but not in the context of their color, right? Often, Augustine's referred to the father of orthodox theology. His teachings have been, uh, and doctoral opinions have been chronicled and taught in seminaries for years and years and years, right? Another individual uh, that I want to mention is Athanasius, right? So um, the, in church history, you'll hear about the Council of Nicaea. Right, uh, the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. And there was a heresy that was being spread that Jesus was not uh, divine. He was a created being of God, right? So this is a heresy, this is not true. And Athanasius, who was the Bishop of Alexandria, um, mentioned or did a compelling, uh, spirit-filled, 
Bible centric um, defense of the divinity of Christ. So much so that from then on, or at the at the uh, at the council, they agreed that you know what the divinity of Christ has been substantiated. This father of church history, Athanasius, was the one that helped um, that mounted that defense and really helped refute the that heresy. And then, lastly, I want to talk about Tertullian and Cartridge. Uh, cartilage. Um, many of us who study church history have heard of Tertullian because of his uh, explanation and teaching of the Godhead. Tertullian, who was in all likelihood a black man, is the one that first used the term Trinity. He first coined and used the term Trinity, right, to explain the Godhead concept and how God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are one. We still believe that the Trinity is the depiction of, of God, right, Godhead. So what am I sharing? Not only in biblical history, right, Genesis to Revelation, but also church history, the years following, during the spread of the gospel, during the defense of the gospel, and the articulation of the doctrines that we hold to today, Black individuals, descendants of Ham and African descent, are instrumental in the Christian belief system. This has been the Bible in real life. And this three-part series should do a couple things. Number one, it should encourage you to understand that, hey, you know what? When you study scripture, when you walk out scripture and you begin to share the doctrines and the beliefs of Christ, you are amongst a long line of thoughtful, educated, doctrinally sound Black men, <laughs> men of African descent, right? Secondly, uh, thirdly, I don't remember which one. Also, I want to um, encourage you to continue seeing how your contributions, you know, normally in February, we talk about the contributions in, you know, education, in the civil rights movement of Black people, in inventions, right, in literature or poetry or government, I wanted to show you the history and the involvement of African descent in church history, in biblical history, in salvific history, the history of salvation, and how God interacts with the world. We are valued, um, and not just us, because we, we read in Galatians, that need, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, right? So in Christ, we're all one. And that's the point. In the body of Christ, the reason there wasn't this big emphasis on, hey, this was a black man, it's because they're God's people, right? God created us from Adam and Eve. We're all part of one family. And we want to embrace the differences and also celebrate the contributions and also understand that we were all created in God's image with intellect, ability, and authority. There you go. How's that? All right. This is Lee Fuller, Bible in Real Life. I hope you've been encouraged in this study. I hope you go back and read some of the references. Go back and listen to the other podcasts and just understand that you are somebody. I keep going back. After all this, I keep going back to Jesse Jackson. Really? But he's Reverend, right? But anyway. Um, so be encouraged. This is the Bible in real life. You young black listener were instrumental in the biblical process and biblical history. Um, so take, take pride in that golly pride, I guess. <laughs> um, all right. Love you. And next week, or yes, next week, we will be going, I I'm trying to get a couple people on the podcast. I'll, we'll see if it happens. 
um, to talk about this further, or we'll continue with our next topic. So stay tuned. Make sure you're subscribed. Follow us on Instagram. Follow us on YouTube and follow us on Facebook. This is the Bible in Real Life, Bible in Real Life podcast. Thank you for listening. God bless you and have a good one. Bye-bye, everybody.